Buenas noches, buenas noches. Thank you for watching Lewis Cruz TV. I hope you enjoy the educational purpose only material that I'm about to bring out. Estas son una historia que es para la gente para que me entretenga de Puerto Rico. Peace and blessings once again to all the kings and queens. Enjoy. distant from your murmuring beaches, I long to return, I long to return. Verde Luz describes the beauty of Puerto Rico, mi Puerto Rico. Like many Puerto Ricans, I didn't grow up on the island. I grew up here in the South Bronx. But Verde Luz still lives in my heart. Here's where I grew up. 748 Beck Street. This building was one big happy family, mostly Puerto Ricans. In this eight room apartment, I lived with my mother, my father, my sister, my grandmother, my grandfather, my great aunt Titi Maria, and our Kali, Sabu. Upstairs, my godmother Casilda lived with her six kids. Next door, my best friend Brenda lived. And downstairs in that little first window where it's where Doña Provi, the grandmother of everybody lived. She used to check us out all the time. And I used to sit in this window for hours, checking out the neighborhood, sometimes reading my books. It's the first time in some 20 years that I got off at Longwood Avenue and walked up the block to my old neighborhood. I was surprised to find that on the one hand, it didn't look as bad as I thought, although it still needs help. And on the other hand, everything seems smaller. This was my elementary school, PS62. Every morning, I walked three blocks to Southern Boulevard, got here at 8 o'clock, and lined up for roll call right in this yard before entering the building. I had very good teachers then, but there was very little in my books about Puerto Rico. And newspapers weren't much better, mostly displaying ads to attract tourists. Come to the Enchanted Island, they read. This was our movie theater. Right here, my best friend Brenda and I saw Rita Moreno and West Side Story about a dozen times. I also remember that in 1950, my baby sister arrived along with a brand new Zenith TV. And you know, I don't think I ever saw a Puerto Rican on television until I was about 20 years old. We're going to leave my childhood home in the South Bronx so I can show you a Puerto Rico beyond West Side Story and postcard images. Mi Puerto Rico land culturally united and politically divided. I was 12 years old the first time I visited Puerto Rico. The minute I landed, I fell in love with the colors of nature, the air, the light, and the warmth of the people. Since then, I have learned that Puerto Rico is really four islands, an archipelago set in the middle of the Caribbean. Puerto Ricans are mestizo, 
a mixture of native Taino Indian, Spanish, and African bloodlines. Today, 3.5 million Puerto Ricans live on the islands. Another 2.7 million live in the U.S. Regardless of where they live, Puerto Ricans see themselves as a distinct nationality. They feel Puerto Rico is a country with its own history and unique culture, separate from the United States. Puerto Rico became a territory of the United States when it was invaded in 1898. Fifty years later, its status changed to Commonwealth. Under Commonwealth, Puerto Rico has internal governmental autonomy and economic support from the United States. In exchange, the United States has ultimate authority over Puerto Rican affairs and keeps a dozen military installations on its soil. Join me as I visit my two homes, mis dos casas. We'll begin our journey in Vieques, a 12-mile-long island off the southeast coast of Puerto Rico. For hundreds of years, Viequenses supported themselves as farmers and fishermen. Among them were my grandparents. In 1940, the United States Navy began negotiations with Puerto Rico to purchase two-thirds of Vieques. Seven years later, the Navy had established two bases at either end of this tiny island, leaving Viequenses wedged in the middle. In front of you, look at that, a sign, Navy out. Marina go home. Fuera la Marina. Puerto Ricans have protested military presence in Vieques since the 1950s. These protests are one example of how the U.S.-Puerto Rican relationship has played itself out for nearly 100 years. This is the Plaza of Isabel II. This placita, like those in every town across Puerto Rico, is the heart of a pueblo. But in one way, this town is like no other, because periodically notices are distributed and posted cautioning Viequenses of scheduled bombing runs to take place on both ends of the island. The Navy's presence on Vieques began after World War II when it was used as a training site for military maneuvers. D-Day in the Caribbean. 15,000 U.S. troops swarm ashore on Vieques Island, Puerto Rico, as the Army, Navy, and Air Force stage their biggest combined maneuver since the war. Operation Over the years, these maneuvers and bombing runs have almost destroyed the fishing industry and the island's economy, forcing many Viequenses to leave, including my grandparents. The Navy's presence continues to this day. It was a joint effort of all the United Constantemente States. Constante tirar de, de los aviones, de manera que nuestro pueblo está constantemente sometido a ese constante bombardeo. Las implicaciones de esas maniobras, mucho más allá que la consecuencia, es la destrucción de nuestros recursos naturales, es la destrucción de nuestras eh, corales, es la destrucción de nuestras playas. Uh, we feel very, very strongly that the very, very pristine nature of the uh, grounds, the beaches, uh, the, uh, the uh, environmentally protected and conserved areas are probably preserved and protected and pristine simply because we're there. Hay quienes se oponen a, a, a la lucha de la Marina en Vieques porque hace daño al ambiente y son los defensores del ambiente. Otros que creen que la presencia militar es una expresión del colonialismo. Y otros pues hacen presencia dentro de esto eh, desde su concepción eh, anticolonialista. Otros creen que la tierra de Vieques es para hacer la paz, para hacer el amor para no ser la guerra, que esto es una tierra que debe ser que debe ser bendecida. Remember that uh, we in the military are there to protect the United States, that our job is defense of the United States. 
and until such time as there is no requirement to train to defend the United States and no further requirement for the United States Navy to be part of that process, at that time perhaps we could say that we would be able to do away with those very, very precious training areas that we have. On my trip from Vieques back to the mainland, I wondered how many more years of clashes would take place between the Viequenses and the military. To get an answer, I went to Old San Juan, where I met with the founder of the Center for Puerto Rican and Caribbean Studies. My family is from Vieques, and I was recently there, and I was appalled to find that 72% of the land belongs to the military, that they're still there. Why? No, it's the same uh, old story that Puerto Rico, even under Spain, was a very important stronghold for the empire, for maintaining the empire here in the Caribbean. So it seems to me that as long as the military is there, the Puerto Ricano is always going to try to get them out, and there's always going to be oh, a clash. Oh, there always will be a clash, and we will be claiming for the return of Vieques uh, to Puerto Rico. Listening to Don Alegria, I began to understand that, simply put, the Akinses want control of their island. I believe what Puerto Ricans also want is control over their cultural and political destiny. We often say, if you have 10 Puerto Ricans in a room, you can count on there being a thousand opinions. In the debate over Puerto Rico's relationship with the U.S., Many support the status quo, Commonwealth. Others want Puerto Rico to become the 51st state. Still others want complete independence for Puerto Rico. One thing everyone can agree on, though, is that the preservation of language, culture, and history is crucial to our survival and dignity, our dignidad. Those who favor independence have expressed commitment to this cause in a number of ways. Some have used armed struggle, some have used pacific militancy, some have used parliamentary methods. I think that occurred almost everywhere in the modern struggle for independence. The group that has attracted the most attention to the cause of independence is the nationalists. Their tactics have been dramatic, and often violent. Two of the most famous attempts to bring world attention to Puerto Rico's status took place in the 1950s. The first, an armed attack against President Truman at Blair House. The second, on March 1, 1954, in the U.S. Congress, when nationalist Lolita Lebron led three men into the House of Representatives, firing their guns and shouting, Puerto Rico is not free. In Washington, D.C., ruthless, fanatic violence erupted in the halls of Congress. Three men and a woman opened fire from the visitors' gallery of the House of Representatives. Five congressmen were hit. Estimates of the numbers of shots fired range from 15 to 30, and each bullet hole found is a grim reminder to those who were present of the terrible surprise attack. The gang was held at police headquarters as a widespread search was launched for others who shared in the plot. To Irving Forrest, Raphael Miranda, Mrs. Lolita Lebron, Andre Cordero, the gun wielders, and to their accomplices goes the evil distinction of having perpetrated a criminal outrage almost unique in America's history. Wanton violence that shocked and stirred the nation and did only harm to the cause of the Puerto Rican people. This type of extreme radical activity is not well thought of or accepted in a stability of an American form of government, a democratic form of government. That's probably the worst type of activity if you wish to have your cause heard and decided positively. Congressman Paul Kanjorski and Bill Emerson were pages in the House of Representatives the day of the Nationalists' attack in 1954. But when I looked up, uh, I could see people with uh, firing guns and uh, a woman trying to unfurl a flag. Uh, that was Lolita Lebron. She was sort of the, uh, the mastermind of the whole thing. The element of which uh, Lolita Lebron was a part uh, was a small element uh, in Puerto Rico. 
As a matter of fact, the group itself never outnumbered uh, 500 people. I, I look back on it as, uh, as an incident in our history, uh, uh, but not one really of uh, profound significance. In 1952, Puerto Rico had become a commonwealth of the United States. The next year, the U.S. asked the United Nations to change the definition of Puerto Rico's status from colony to freely associated state. The U.N. complied. But the nationalists believed Puerto Rico was still a colony. They felt the only way to make the world aware of their objection was to make a dramatic statement directly to the American government. I mean, I always say that there are two forces that move uh, men. One is religion and another is the love for their country. And in this case, uh, Lolita and the others thought that uh, Puerto Rico was uh, being oppressed and that they, they wanted, I don't think they were wanted to do harm uh, to people, they just wanted to call the attention because sometimes you get desperate when you have a message which you think is the correct one and nobody cares about it. On the day of the attack, Rafael Cancel Miranda was 24 years old. We are willing to do what it takes to be a free country. We are not violent people, but the enemy is violent. And they use violence against our people. So uh, if we have to use violence against the enemy, we use it. In Puerto Rico, we have met ourselves in this, in this kind of divide, in this strong sense of no matter the, the economic benefits that have been achieved, no matter the political uh, in, examples that we can set, here are people who have reached deep down in their own history and saying, look, we're just expressing what you expressed in 1776. Borinquen, for thousands of years a lush paradise inhabited by Taino farmers and fishermen. Historians estimate that there were anywhere from 20,000 to a half a million Tainos when the Spanish landed in 1508. To finance its exploration into the New World, Spain needed gold. In their quest, they forced indigenous peoples into slavery, but the Tainos labored in vain. Within decades, thousands of Tainos died from forced labor, from diseases brought by the Spaniards, and during periodic uprisings against the Spanish. By 1582, only a few hundred Tainos remained, hidden in the central highlands of an island the Spanish renamed Puerto Rico, rich port. Today, remains of Taino culture can be found in the ruins of villages, the names of dozens of towns, and in thousands of words. Among them, Huracan, Hurricane. With no gold to be found, the Spanish began to cultivate and refine sugar. They joined the rest of Europe and the United States in the triangle trade, exchanging goods for African slaves to replace Taino laborers. Trade in the 1800s brought an increased appetite for sugar and coffee to Europe. The need for workers and merchants on the island also increased. The island's population grew due to immigration and intermarriage. Puerto Ricans adopted Spanish dress, customs, and religion, and class distinctions between the elite, the mestizos, and the Africans developed. By the 1890s, Puerto Rico had become an autonomous province of Spain. They had their own constitution, a house of representatives, an appointed governor, and the right to free commerce. Intellectuals had emerged to express a distinct Puerto Rican vision. Educator and abolitionist Ramón Emeterio Betances authored Los Diez Mandamientos, The Ten Commandments, Abolición de la esclavitud. Abolition of slavery. Libertad de la palabra. Freedom of speech. Derecho de reunión. The right to assembly. Derecho a elegir nuestras autoridades. The right to choose our leaders. 
What was it that drove one of the oldest democracies on Earth to possess what some are now calling one of the oldest colonies on Earth? In the late 1800s, European nations felt increasing pressure to guide their lesser developed colonies into the 20th century. But the United States had their own plans for the Western Hemisphere. They recognized that the Caribbean was the gateway to Latin America and Puerto Rico's strategic location was key to controlling that gateway. The only obstacle to United States plans for expansion was Spain's grip on the region. While anchored in Havana's harbor, the USS Maine exploded and sank. The United States seized the opportunity to declare war on Spain. The Spanish-American War began in May of 1898 and ended in victory for the United States 115 days later. Spain granted independence to Cuba. Puerto Rico and the Philippines became U.S. territories. Before being transferred from one country to the other, Puerto Rico would have only a few precious days of freedom. During that time, sociologist Eugenio Maria de Hostos wrote these words in his diary. Yesterday, I spent the whole day with my binoculars in my hands. I saw everything. I looked and looked again. I admired it, blessed it, and felt it. I felt it for her beauty and her misfortune. I thought how noble it would have been to see her free by her own effort, and how sad and overwhelming and shameful to see her go from owner to owner without ever being her own master, and to see her pass from sovereignty to sovereignty without ever ruling herself. General Nelson A. Miles commandeered the invasion of Puerto Rico. Twenty years earlier, he had led American troops into the Great Plains. It was Miles who arrested Geronimo. Later, he forced the Nez Perce Indians from their tribal homeland in Montana into Canada. The United States military carried with it into the Caribbean, into the Philippines, into Puerto Rico, into all of the places it went in the early 20th century, it carried with it the memory of how it had dealt with Native Americans. We have not come to make war upon the people of a country that for centuries has been oppressed, but on the contrary, to bring you protection, to promote your prosperity, and to bestow upon you the immunities and blessings of the liberal institutions of our government. Steering his ships towards the port of Fajardo, Miles changed course in midstream and landed right here in the fishing village of Guanica. The first order of business was to raise the American flag in order to claim this rich garden for themselves. Almost 100 years later, the anniversary of the invasion is marked by some who look upon Miles as an oppressor. Today, they are aligned with either the independence or the nationalist movements. Those who look upon Miles as a liberator today align themselves with the pro-statehood movement. While in Guanica, I visited with the Olabarrieta family, who are descendants of the original supporters of the 1898 invasion. They live right in front of the bay where General Miles landed. Why don't we take a look? Enseñame la bandera. Sí, la tenemos aquí al lado. Since then, they have been the proud owners of the original flag carried by his troops. Oftentimes, they find themselves involved in a curious exercise. They must move the flag from house to house among family members in order to keep it from the nationalists. To those in the nationalist movement, the flag is a symbol of oppression. 
Exactly. This is the flag that Miles raised when he landed here in um, 1898, July 21st or 25th? 25th. The Ola Barrieta family is unique in that they're all in favor of statehood for Puerto Rico. El calor de esta isla no se pierde porque yo hablo un poco más de inglés o deje de hablar un poco de inglés o seleccione un presidente. Lo que me hace ser a mí persona y Puerto Rico y puertorriqueña viene de tantas generaciones que aún con el cambio de gobierno no se pierde. No dejamos de ser puertorriqueños en el 1898 cuando entraron los, los, los americanos. Seguimos con nuestra idiosincrasia de pueblo. Most Puerto Rican families are divided on the status question. For example, my grandfather was an independentista, my mother was for Commonwealth, and my grandmother was a true nacionalista. Sin sacrificar nuestra nuestra idiosincrasia, nuestro 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 ser, nuestro ser distinto, ser puertorriqueño. Todo lo más que podamos llegar sin sacrificar. Puerto Rico has four political parties. The Popular Democratic Party favors the status quo, Commonwealth. The new progressive party supports U.S. statehood for the island. The nationalists also want liberty, but don't participate in the political process, protesting what they believe is an illegal colonial relationship. The variety of views about what is right for Puerto Rico emerges in the platforms of the island's official parties. I'm convinced that statehood is best because I believe in my U.S. citizenship and I want to be a U.S. citizen. But I think the first decision a Puerto Rican has to make is whether he wants to be a U.S. citizen or not. To try to be a U.S. citizen without the same rights, without the same obligations, it's, it's just it would be a, it's a very frustrating relationship like we have now. We are a territory of the United States. We call ourselves a commonwealth. But we're a territory. We're not self-governing. That is the biggest lie that Puerto Rico has ever been uh, uh, subjected to. We are a distinct nationality, and as a distinct nationality, we yearn for independence. If everybody became confused all of a sudden, and 100 percent of Puerto Ricans opted for statehood, the big question is, what about 15 years from now? Will that nationality not yearn for independence then? As long as there is a nationality, there will be a struggle for independence, and it will only end when we have national sovereignty, independence. There are two main values in Puerto Rico, which are present in Commonwealth. One is the affirmation of the Puerto Rican personality, our identity as a people. We are not a minority, we are majority in our land. We have our own language, our own culture, and we don't want to be assimilated in any other culture. In the other way, we want social progress, economic development, the, the feeling of security that the American citizenship brings to our people and our freedom to travel with the U.S. citizenship. Y con unas narecitas que llevaron de Seiba, donde se quedaron. Que ningún pueblo quiere ser esclavo. Y vamos, vamos a... a a la independencia de Puerto Rico, lo vamos a hacer. Jaquel, no te quepa la menor. There were similar divisions amongst Puerto Ricanos under Spanish rule. They continued when ownership of Puerto Rico was transferred from Spain to the U.S. It was swelteringly hot. No Spaniard was present. After the signatures were all down on paper, Secretary of State John Day walked over to a huge globe which is in the corner of the room, and he began to turn it slowly, and in the, in the best real estate promoter's uh, height, he said, now let's see what we get by all this. So there were some leaders in Congress who wanted to 
to grant uh, freedom to Puerto Rico in the same way as to Cuba, because they were afraid that uh, an imperialistic policy would be developed uh, by the United States. Uh, but uh, then the United States prevailed the idea that uh, they have to maintain some bases here, and also that uh, they will study the situation, and they are still studying it. Bowed by the weight of centuries, he leans upon his hoe and gazes on the ground, the emptiness of ages in his face, and on his back the burden of the world. Who made him dead to rapture in despair, a thing that grieves not and that never hopes? O masters, lords, and rulers in all lands, how will the future reckon with this man when this dumb terror shall rise to judge the world after the silence of the centuries? The Americans like to believe that they really liberated Puerto Rico. Um, they didn't liberate Puerto Rico. What they did was conquer it. And they convinced themselves they were not like the European powers in this. But in reality, they acted in much the same way. Before the U.S. invasion, Puerto Ricans owned 93% of the farmland on the island. Over the next 30 years, 46% of that land would be bought up by the Big Four. Absentee-owned American corporations interested in the development of one product, sugar. Caña. La cosecha más importante de Puerto Rico. In addition to sugar, U.S. industrialists developed the tobacco and fruit markets in Puerto Rico. Thousands of former agricultural workers and landowners had one option, become daily wage earners in U.S.-owned fields. La caña deja más dinero que cualquier otro producto y paga mejores jornales. Wages in agricultural industries averaged 75 cents a day. As the U.S. took over Puerto Rico's farming industry, the island's economy quickly changed. Puerto Ricans produced what they could not consume and consumed what they could not produce. Esta ley asegura a todos los trabajadores el derecho a formar uniones libres con sus compañeros de trabajo. There was no job security for workers. Unions were formed, but they couldn't calm fluctuations in the global sugar market, which constantly threatened to throw masses of workers into unemployment. Economic advancement escaped the vast majority of Puerto Ricans and set the stage for Puerto Rico's legacy of dependence on the United States. The once thriving sugar industry collapsed over a 20-year period that began in the 1940s. The phase-out coincided with a post-depression plan to develop new industries in Puerto Rico. On my journey through the island, I took a group of workers back to one of the deserted Big Four sugar refineries, Guanica Central. They had last worked there 30 years ago. Their parents had also worked in the plant during the height of the Depression in the 1930s. Naturalmente, el azúcar caía, acababa de salir, caliente. Ve que no tiene ni una sola ventana, ni un solo sitio por donde entre el aire, pues era tremendamente sucio. ¿Cuánto le pagaban? Se trabajaba 12 horas diarias. Eh, por cerca de seis meses que duraba la zafra. Bueno, todo el año, porque en Invernazo también se trabajaban 12 horas diarias. Entiendo que ellos ganaban medio dólar el día por 12 horas. Era, entonces, pues, estaban bien, porque había quien no trabajaba. La vida era, pues, por ejemplo, había una división total entre americanos y puertorriqueños. 
Hospital Americano, Hospital Puertorriqueño, Hotel Americano, Hotel Puertorriqueño, en la playa, lo que hoy llaman mal llamada Playa Santa, porque no tiene nada de santa. ¿Y ¿Cómo se sentían su, su, pa, su padre cuando...? No conocíamos nada más. Ellos no conocían, ellos menos, no, ellos no conocían nada más. Eh, sin entrar en política, era en la época de los colmillú y el que estaba trabajando estaba bien. Se consideraba estar bien porque pues, ellos no conocieron nada más, se criaron en eso, igual que nosotros. Nos criamos en este ambiente de, 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 de ingenio azucarero, por lo tanto, pues... Colmillú, ¿qué significa eso? <risa> <risa> yo, no quería, no quería yo no quería entrar en política, pero no le llamaban colmillos aquellos que todo querían para ellos y nada para el prójimo. Al otro lo que hacían era, como le dije ahorita, ordeñar, sacarle sin darle. O sea, se oprimía al pobre y se hacía más pobre. El rico se hacía más rico. As I heard their stories and toured the abandoned factory, I saw why, in their parents' time, Puerto Rico was fertile ground for political change. Luis Muñoz Marín's career in politics began in 1920 when he joined the Socialist Party in Puerto Rico. He was the son of Luis Muñoz Rivera, who authored the Spanish Charter of Autonomy in 1897. When his father died, Muñoz Marín made this promise. Borinquen, if someday you need my blood, count on it. It is red blood the same that ran through my father's veins. As a young man, Luis Muñoz Marín spent 12 years in the United States, living in New York's Greenwich Village. In the cafes of the village, Muñoz Marín began to shape his dream for Puerto Rico's future. By the time he left in 1931, he defined himself as an economic socialist and radical nationalist committed, above all, to independence for Puerto Rico. His granddaughter explains. He felt a moral obligation to do something about Puerto Rico because Puerto Rico, Spain lost that war with the United States and Puerto Rico, well, fue regalado. It's just, Spain just gave us away to the United States. And he grew up in that era and that mentality. Uh, he wanted to change, fundamentally change, the way we see ourselves. After over 400 years of domination and poverty, Muñoz Marín saw that Puerto Ricans had grown passive and were helpless to challenge the entrenched political system. If they were to succeed in their fight for independence, they would have to do it on a full stomach. He wanted to participate and Puerto Rico's destiny. He made a huge sacrifice in pushing the cause of, let's try to lift as many people out of poverty as we can. Let's start with that. Poverty and education and healthcare uh, and housing. Let's, let, we'll start with that and that will take a long time. In the 1932 election, Luis Muñoz Marin voted for the nationalist candidate Pedro Albizu Campos. Pedro Albizu Campos had returned from Harvard Law School to Puerto Rico in 1921 to stake his claim on Puerto Rico's future. He was born in one of Puerto Rico's poorest barrios, the illegitimate son of a white merchant and black servant woman. A brilliant student, he attended Harvard College on a Rotary scholarship. Like his contemporary Muñoz Marín, he believed that the only solution for his country's problems was self-determination. He called dependence on the United States a political illness. Pedro Albizu Campos said, you know, self-sufficiency is good. We can take care of ourselves. We can go back to the land. Uh, we can, we can, uh, that Puerto Rico is rich and that we can be self-sufficient if we work hard. He was about work ethic. He was about working hard. He was about taking away the chains of dependency. If you look at um, 
what uh, Munoz Marin and uh, Abizu Campos were talking about in the 1930s. Uh, these two very remarkable persons were essentially talking about the same things, about what had happened to Puerto Rico and why it had come about and what was needed and, and needed to be done. But they followed separate paths. In 1930, the Nacionalistas elected Pedro Albizu Campos president of the party. He immediately made his plans clear. Take your country back, he told them. Then we'll fix it ourselves. Aquí nadie tiene derecho a ejercer ninguna autoridad que no emane directamente de Puerto Rico. Y los yanquis no quieren que Puerto Rico se constituya en una nación libre, soberana, independiente. Y hasta tanto Puerto Rico no sea libre, soberano, independiente, y confiar autoridad a alguien, nadie tiene ninguna autoridad en Puerto Rico. Ni jueces, ni fiscales, ni policía, ni gobernadores, ni ningún charlatán en Puerto Rico. The United States decided that Albizu was creating trouble here in Puerto Rico, and it was true that Albizu was really uh, giving a very strong speeches and there was already some clashes between the nationalists and the police. The great colonial era was coming to an end and the nationalists, uh, the Puerto Ricans, uh, were simply reminding them that, well, the liberators have liberated a lot of other places, but they're not liberating us. Instead of bending to the will of the Puerto Rican people, the United States repressed the Puerto Rican nationalist movement of the 1930s, while it was still an independence movement. That means when their method of struggle was the Pacific civil way. This was exactly the sort of way that would validate uh, some older imperial notions that these were emotional, unstable people and would ultimately you know, resort to violence. El imperio, cuando vio que todo el pueblo estaba con él, especialmente la clase trabajadora, como se iban, tras él, pensaron que iban a perder la colonia, esta colonia que le estaba dando tan pingües ganancias. De ahí, el usar ellos la violencia y decir que don Pedro quería dejocar el gobierno de Estados Unidos a la fuerza y a la violencia. As nationalists intensify their activities, the newly elected president of the United States, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, appointed a new governor of Puerto Rico. Blanton Winship, who was the adjunct general of the War Department, hailed from Georgia. Ricardo Alegría describes him. A southerner uh, with a lot of prejudice and a man that was really against uh, Albizu. We consider Winship uh, the worst governor that we suffer in Puerto Rico. Uh, and there was a movement here to demand from President Roosevelt to take uh, Winship away from Puerto Rico. Winship soon embarked on a collision course with Albizu Campos and the Nationalists. Albizu was arrested and accused of conspiring to overthrow the federal government in Puerto Rico. His first trial ended in a hung jury. <laughs> Convicted of sedition in a second trial, this time by an American jury, Albizu was sentenced to 10 years in federal prison. During that term, a series of confrontations between nationalists and authorities culminated in a clash known as the Ponce Massacre. It was Palm Sunday, 1937. What began as a peaceful march to commemorate the abolition of slavery suddenly became one of the most violent incidents in Puerto Rican history. The governor called the mayor of Ponce and said, no, cancel that permit. Then the nationalist says, no, we are going to march. Photographs show that young nationalist cadets participating in the event were unarmed. As the national hymn of Puerto Rico played, the parade advanced. Policemen, armed with revolvers, shotguns, and tear gas bombs, infiltrated the crowd. Other policemen, armed with Thompson submachine guns, were behind the marchers. Suddenly, 
shots were fired. When it was over, 20 were dead, and over 150 lay wounded. Children were murdered right there in that three block from here. Children, children, and I don't mean in, in, in an abstract way, children with flesh, children, women. My father, he was a nationalist already. My mother, she came dressed in white because she was from the Las Enfermeras de la República, the, the nurse. And she went back to home, home in, in red because she had to crawl over the dead bodies of, of, of the ones who were already killed. Well, the Ponce Massacre was a turning point because it offered to, to the nationalists a particularly uh, affirmation of what some of them had been saying for a, a long time, that really their use of violence uh, would be justified and be justified in the future simply because this is the way, this was the context in which the U.S.-Puerto Rican relationship had taken shape. It meant that this seed of violence really really would germinate and um, the justification for it would survive. In July of 1938, one year after the Ponce Massacre, Luis Muñoz Marin formed a new party that supported independence for Puerto Rico. Its name, the Partido Popular Democrático, or the Popular Democratic Party. Its slogan, bread, land, and liberty. A jíbaro, or peasant, graced its flag. Muñoz Marín spent the next two years campaigning for a seat in the Puerto Rican Senate. He crisscrossed the island, selling his program for economic stability directly to the Puerto Rican people. Back then, it was person to person. Back then, you weren't part of a crowd, you were part of a group, and it was a more intimate group. His commitment to helping democratize Puerto Rico was so great that he spent his first years in politics just trying to get people to vote, motivate people to vote. People felt that their vote really didn't count that much, that its value was maybe a dollar, its value was a pair of shoes, its value was maybe some rice. But he promised change, and he was so sure of it that if they didn't like what he did, in four years, vote for somebody else. In 1940, an acquaintance of Muñoz Marín's became chancellor of the University of Puerto Rico. Rexford Tugwell was a member of President Roosevelt's New Deal Brain Trust and a progressive thinker. Although he did not favor independence for Puerto Ricans, he believed that they should have more autonomy and the right to elect their own governor. Tugwell realized the importance of basic economic reform. His book, The Stricken Land, described living conditions in Puerto Rico. Wages were miserable, living costs high, housing as bad surely as any in the world. People half starved on a diet inherited by tradition from the days of slavery and sick with all the diseases to which malnourished and ill-housed people are subject in the tropics. Just before the 1940 elections, the United States put pressure on the Popular Democratic Party to turn away from the fight for independence. In response, the PDP declared that status is not an issue and narrowed its focus to social and economic reform. Running on this platform, Luis Muñoz Marín was elected to the Puerto Rican Senate and became its president. In 1941, on Muñoz Marín's recommendation, President Roosevelt appointed Rexford Tugwell governor of Puerto Rico. Working together, Muñoz Marín and Tugwell tackled the first task at hand, 
land reform. They immediately began a program in which uh, land was distributed uh, to thousands of Puerto Ricans, uh, small plots that were given to them to be used by them and their families. It was not the situation before in which they used to live as agregados in a, in a farm that they didn't belong to them and they, they could be expelled at any moment. Hmm. So for many uh, thousands of Puerto Rica, they became land owner owners for the first time in, in their family <laughs> history. <laughs> Tugwell and Muñoz Marín continued to work together to implement programs that would lift Puerto Rico out of poverty and into a new industrial era. As U.S. corporations took over management of island-owned businesses, Muñoz Marín began to see the handwriting on the wall. Muñoz Marín, uh, by the late 30s and certainly by the early 40s, recognized, and he had persuasive evidence, he knew the United States and he knew its culture, that um, Puerto Ricans could never um, resolve their needs, really, uh, by simply debating independence or statehood, that they needed uh, to follow a different route. World War II provided an opportunity for Muñoz Marín to more closely align Puerto Rico with the United States. As 65,000 Puerto Ricans served in U.S. armed forces around the globe, Muñoz Marín began to shape a different kind of alliance with the United States. Los Puerto Ricanos estamos desarrollando y estableciendo la democracia in the campo de nuestra vida económica en pleno desarrollo de justicia para las masas de nuestro país. Mi pueblo de Puerto Rico está luchando esta guerra en defensa de los principios de la democracia con la cooperación entera del presidente Roosevelt y del gran pueblo de los Estados Unidos. Puerto Rico aumenta la producción. El gobierno ha aumentado la producción de nuestra isla con nuevas industrias, nuevas cosechas, la cría de mejor ganado y demás productos agrícolas. In 1947, the U.S. launched an economic program in Puerto Rico to create new income-producing businesses. Operation Bootstrap was designed to attract American industry to the island and employ Puerto Ricans. In 1945, when the immense majority of the Puerto Rican people again wanted to opt for independence, the United States, in effect, told Luis Muñoz Marín, either you opt for another way out or we won't support you anymore. That's what, in fact, changed Muñoz Marín's mind. It was not the fact that Muñoz suddenly became a convert against independence. It's the fact that he was faced with that ultimatum, directly or indirectly, by the United States government. So either you govern Puerto Rico or you stop being an independentista. Well, the way out for Muñoz was very simple. He stopped being an independentista. In 1948, the Puerto Rican legislature passed Law 53, known as La Ley de la Mordaza, or the Muzzle Law. This unconstitutional gag law forbade nationalists from speaking or gathering in public or writing about their views. It would later be amended to make membership in any nationalist organization unlawful. After 50 years of U.S.-appointed leadership, the U.S. Congress permitted Puerto Ricans to choose their own governor. In 1949, carrying over 60% of the vote, Luis Muñoz Marín became the first governor of Puerto Rico to be elected by his own people. During his first year in office, Muñoz Marín announced his plans for a new U.S.-Puerto Rico relationship. He called it Commonwealth, from the British term describing a former colony 
still partially ruled by the monarch. He translated it to Spanish as Estado Libre Asociado, ELA, or Freely Associated State. In July of 1950, President Truman signed ELA, now known as Commonwealth, into law. The nationalists retaliated in a series of uprisings. 20 towns across Puerto Rico were hit. At least 32 people died in savage gun battles in eight towns throughout the island. Principal target was the governor's palace at San Juan. Five armed nationalists drove up to the main gate, one of them carrying a submachine gun and blasted away. Part of their gunfire ripped through the UN flag on the balcony, narrowly missing Governor Luis Marin, who was sitting near the window beyond. Nor was the terror of a tiny minority to be confined to Puerto Rico. In Washington, only hours later, the peace and quiet of Blair House, temporary residence of the president, was shattered. Next, the nationalists tried to assassinate President Truman. The following day, Pedro Albizu Campos was arrested on 12 counts of breaking the gag law and for participating in an armed attack. Intensely anti-American, Campos has previously served six years in federal prison for insurrectionary activity. Hundreds of his followers were also rounded up. From all over the island, they were brought to San Juan for interrogation and careful screening. Wanting to stop nationalist violence, Puerto Ricans turned against Puerto Ricans. Those not aligned with the U.S. and Commonwealth were set apart in a new phenomenon called fichado. In English, the word means marked. Meanwhile, hundreds of thousands of Puerto Ricans go to the polls and register. With Puerto Rico's future at stake, Muñoz Marin urged voters to cast their ballots for Commonwealth. His party's platform was clear. A vote for Commonwealth is a vote against communism. I think Muñoz Marin was manipulating the Americans into believing that uh, what he would do for Puerto Rico if they adopted essentially his plan, it would quell forever the sort of explosiveness and resentments associated with the relationship. Um, the Americans uh, doubtless manipulated him in the sense of believe, making him believe that they accepted him as an equal, that he was different. He was a Puerto Rican who understood complexities of the relationship. Don Pedro Luis Campos always used to say that Americans were not interested in the birds, they were interested in the cage. You know, they were interested in the geopolitical position of Puerto Rico, but there were many birds around, there were many Puerto Ricans around. In spite of nationalist and independentista opposition, two-thirds of the electorate voted for Commonwealth. On the 54th anniversary of the U.S. invasion of Puerto Rico, the celebration of this new relationship began. My view is that it was a cosmetic change in the relationship, that the colony remained, and that even though in Spanish uh, the term is Estado Libre Asociado, freely associated state, and in English, of course, commonwealth, at bottom, uh, at the center, is, is still the sort of relationship that is as much colonial uh, as it ever was. I think my grandfather would have, would have preferred that Commonwealth be the stepping stone to independence because he wanted independence originally. But as we, he came more closely involved in politics, he saw that we are a marionette of the United States. And what we ask for, we don't necessarily get. In fact, we don't get it. You, you give up all your aces, and you do that so that people here have, have, are well nutritioned in, 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 their, in their mind, their body, their soul, everything. In the end, Muñoz Marín could not deliver on his promise to end nationalist violence. Two years after Commonwealth was established, the nationalists attacked Congress. Luis Muñoz Marín was summoned to Washington by President Eisenhower. 
you know, this uh, group to which uh, the authors of this dastardly deed uh, uh, obviously belong is a tiny group in Puerto Rico. There are less than 500 of them in the whole island. Puerto Rico rounds up its nationalist fanatics following the wounding of five U.S. congressmen. Ringleader of the group, Pedro Campos, is subdued after a two-hour gun battle with police. Campos now faces the original 89-year sentence imposed at the time of the attempt on former President Truman's life, from which he had been paroled. In 1957, the gag law was repealed. Throughout the island. While in prison in Puerto Rico, Pedro Albizu Campos claimed that he was tortured by exposure to radiation. He was pronounced insane. Recent disclosures confirm that in the 1950s, prisoners in Puerto Rico and the United States were used in radiation experiments. After serving 14 years of his 73-year term in prison, Pedro Albizu Campos fell ill. He was pardoned by Luis Muñoz Marin. After his release, Pedro Albizu Campos was hospitalized while recovering from a stroke. For the first time, he was able to see grandchildren who were born while he was in prison. Granddaughter Rosa Meneses recalls this moment. Y mira, con una cara, verdad, de asombro, los ojos bien abiertos, y ve a mami y empezó a reír y empezó a llorar a la vez. Ese es un recuerdo que a mí jamás se me va a olvidar. Porque entonces después, él, con el brazo que podía mover, él nos empezó a abrazar a todas. Date cuenta, él, o sea, yo me ubico en el lugar de él, ¿no? Que él, tantos años de sufrimiento, alejado de su familia, pues encontrarse con esos hijos de sus hijos que él no conocía, pues tiene que haber sido una emoción muy fuerte. Y está esa imagen en mi mente bien clara de él llorando y riendo a la vez, ya y apretando mucho. His ideals for Puerto Rico are shared by probably the majority of Puerto Ricans, by even the most, uh, the most fervent pro-statehooders respect Pedro Albizu Campo because he represents our culture. He represents Puerto Ricanidad. And even the most fervent statehooder does not want to lose that, which is us. What Albizu managed to do, even when he was disregarded, was to be our conscious, our conscious. He insisted that Puerto Rico, that is Puerto Rico, Puerto Rico, and Puerto Rico. That's the Holy Trinity. And that has a lot to do with why that poster on San Sebastián is untouched. Why it rains and why, and people throw beer and people urinate and people lean against the walls in these passionate kisses, but never on that poster. I mean, Albizu Campos and the other nationalists uh, inevitably had to, con to be in conflict with the United States. But the, the conflict essentially was cultural, that Albizu Campos and um, the nationalists, I think, probably have a much better grasp of Puerto Rican identity and what can be lost through this process of connection to, to the United States. As a child, my mother cautioned me, learn English, querida, but never, never forget your Spanish. It's the language your grandparents speak. It's your heritage. Well, when I came to this school, they said, you're an American now, and here we speak English. Forget your Spanish. I heeded my mother's advice. I learned English, and I didn't forget my Spanish. But standing here, I can still remember being ridiculed by my teachers, and sometimes even hit if I mistakenly uttered a word in Spanish. 
trash. By the 1950s, an average of 40,000 Puerto Ricans a year were migrating to the United States, seduced by the promise of work and a better life. Films like Trabajo para Usted, Work for You, produced by the U.S. Department of Labor, lured them to low-paying jobs in factories and fields. In muchas ocasiones, se hace necesario trabajar los domingos, pero por lo general no se trabaja en ese día. Dedican tiempo para el aseo personal, para lavar la ropa. We like to believe in this country that, that we are an immigrant nation, as Franklin Roosevelt told the daughters of the American Revolution. We're all immigrants. But we also very much like to believe that when people have come here, they've simply discarded, along with uh, a lot of their clothes and other things, they've discarded their sense of cultural identity. That they, they don't... Uh, they give that up. They become something else. Dino. 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 Puerto Rican. Puerto Ricans are like Mexicans, Guatemalans, and others. Very conscious of, of their identity. It's a part of their strength. And I think this is feared. No, my sister's went there. I made a mistake. I went to prison. So I'm back out. And here I am. Watch out. Stay out this time. I'm trying to. I'm going to work for security next week. Oh, good. Good. Try to make it. So, you know, I'm checking out the old neighborhood and... That's good. It ain't like it used to be. Crap messed up everything. You know, actually, it's better than I thought. I well, mean, there are parts of it that are awful and, and worse, and there are other parts that seem to have, like Beck Street, sort of seem to have stayed intact. It still has trees, which surprised me. Well, at night, it changes a little bit. Oh, yeah? It becomes a little worse. Yeah. You know, daytime is everybody sleeping. You know what I'm saying? They wake up about 3, 4, 5 o'clock, and then they go back out to Seattle all night. And that's, that's where crime comes in at. People well, ain't know, interested in their culture no more. No. It's funny because it was tough then, too. Yeah. People like Pedro Piso Acampo, Lolita Lebron gave up their lives, you know what I'm saying? Because for something that's good, and these people don't care. They don't care at all. They don't, they don't even try to study their culture. That's bad. What we do in this country is to reconstruct history. And what we do in, in rewriting our history is um, portray uh, ethnic and, and the, the tremendous diversity that is the American people. We portray them in such a way that, that they are actually led and guided rather than part of the making of their own history. The greatest harm that we have done Puerto Ricans is to take away from them or at least uh, discourage them from uh, seeking their own identity in themselves and who they were in their own heritage, their own past. That is, we have denied to them something that we professedly deny to no one and, and certainly that, that we do not deny ourselves. In spite of the pressure to change, adapt, and discard their ways, I found in the shadow of Bruckner Boulevard this group of urban farmers tending to their casita, just as their mothers and fathers, grandmothers and grandfathers had done back in Puerto Rico. Papas. Papas. Cebolla. Cebolla. Very bien. Tomates. Ironically, Puerto Ricans brought as much cultural vitality to their lives uh, in these places, sometimes to, to very uh, sordid looking places, uh, as any of the other immigrant groups. I never underestimate the capability of people not only to survive, to adapt, but to retain what they consider the best of their culture and to, to fill in the sorts of spaces that um, the modern world has abandoned um, to them and, and create something new. In 1959, Hawaii and Alaska became states, making statehood for Puerto Rico a greater possibility. Pro-statehood Cuban exiles joined pro-statehood Puerto Ricans in the fight for alignment with the United States. 
the bulk of the Cuban exile community in Puerto Rico became a very conservative community regarding the struggle for Puerto Rican independence. And they confused the struggle for Puerto Rican independence with their struggle against communism. Uh, Governor Munoz, has the Castro Revolution in Cuba had any noticeable effect on your people? Not, uh, not in any important way. The Puerto Rican people are very well, uh, have very strong psychological defenses uh, against that kind of a thing. Their, their belief uh, in democracy is deep and their practice of democracy is, I believe, well known outside of Puerto Rico. So they're well, they're spiritually well protected uh, against that. Luis Munoz Marin may have thought Puerto Ricans were spiritually well protected, but the United States felt they were politically unprotected. Concerns over the spread of communism led J. Edgar Hoover to investigate the actions of independent supporters. J. Edgar Hoover was a person who went after vulnerable types to enhance the reputation of the FBI. And who could be more vulnerable than outspoken political leaders who um, had made it quite clear that um, what Puerto Rico obviously needed was something much different than what the United States offered. As long as the United States looked at us as their enemies, there was going to be persecution. Even though that violated the American Constitution, even though it violated all things the Americans said they stood for, even though that persecution was perpetrated without telling the American people about it. Pro-independence activities increased in reaction to the growing pro-statehood movement. In 1962, Juan Mari Bras, president of the newly formed Puerto Rican Socialist Party, took a proposal to the United Nations to force a decision on Puerto Rico's status. It would be five years before the U.S. granted Puerto Rico permission to bring the issue to a vote. No soy yo tu fuerza. Esa es tu fuerza. Tú mismo eres tu fuerza. In 1964, after 16 years as governor, Luis Muñoz Marín announced his retirement. Me voy de un castillo para regresar a las veredas y a los batallas de Puerto Rico. Commonwealth was not the stepping stone to independence Muñoz Marín had hoped for. In 1967, the plebiscite finally took place. Puerto Ricans once again opted for Commonwealth, though by a 15% smaller margin than in 1952. Statehood was increasing in popularity, largely due to the influx of new voters, Cuban exiles. The next year, in 1968, the Statehood Party won control of the Puerto Rican legislature. Luis Ferre, the son of Cuban exiles and a statehood supporter, was elected governor. It's hard to believe, walking in this peaceful setting on a quiet Sunday morning, that in 1970, this was the site of some of the worst violence in Puerto Rican history. The combination of a pro-statehood governor, Luis Ferrer, being elected, hundreds of bombings in the San Juan area, and extreme persecution of the independentistas led to the university being occupied by the police and closed. In the 60s, the gap between pro-statehood and pro-independent supporters had widened. In the 70s, extremists from both sides routinely used bombings, assassinations, and armed attacks to express these differences. This decade would be the most violent in Puerto Rican history. I think it can be argued that uh, the 70s was the end of the U.S. empire in the Caribbean for a number of reasons. Uh, one, the loss of that whole assurance and certainty the uh, chaos that we had gone in the world to correct was now occurring here. And um, this is the sort of thing that in our imperial age would not have happened. A radical pro-independence group calling themselves the FALN 
bombed Francis Tavern, a restaurant in Lower Manhattan. Five people were killed, dozens more were injured. Another radical pro-independence group, Los Macheteros, the machete wielders, robbed a Wells Fargo armored truck in Hartford, Connecticut. In Puerto Rico, they bombed U.S. military aircraft at a San Juan Air Base and attacked a bus carrying naval personnel, killing two and wounding ten. In a remote area of the island, Puerto Rican police brutally beat and then shot to death two alleged independentistas. The police claimed that the young men were plotting to blow up communications towers. Years later, a federal investigation found the Puerto Rican police guilty of murder and official misconduct. The families of Arnaldo Darío Rosado and Carlos Soto Aridi were awarded over a half a million dollars in damages. In 1978, Santiago Mari was found shot to death in his car. He was the son of Socialist Party President Juan Mari Bras. Pro-statehood Cuban exiles were implicated in the murder. They were never brought to trial. Throughout the conflict and violence of the 70s and the early 80s, connections between Puerto Ricans on the island and in the States remain strong. In New York's East Harlem, a new generation of independentistas and community activists, the Young Lords, fought for the well-being and dignity of their Puerto Rican neighbors. I can remember when they set up lunch programs for kids and tested adults for tuberculosis. 25 years later, I met with former Young Lords in front of the People's Church, the site of many of their demonstrations. Back then, Geraldo Rivera was the Young Lord's lawyer, Denise Oliver, the vice chair. Felipe Luciano served as chair of the Young Lords. Hey, this is a long way from 116th Street. Remember? I remember. A lawyer. Yes. Do you remember the... Tell me about those times. The, the march. Felipe and Denise led a march right down Lexington Avenue. On the top of that hill, I looked back down Lexington Avenue, and for as far as the eye could see, there were people marching with us. I think we were headed for the United Nations, if That's I'm not right. mistaken. And to me, that was the high water mark of the movement of self-expression in the Puerto Rican community. It's the Young Lords were famous for the dramatic protests they organized against the city. Their offensives gave New York a run for its money. We had had a Gouverneur Hospital offensive, and we were thinking of taking over Gouverneur Hospital. Make a long story short, cop pushed me, I pushed him back, and it was some sort of altercation. I had to run, and they were chasing me, and they were like on a mission. <laughs> yeah. So now we go up the stairs, and I'm literally going two up, two uh, flights, uh, two stairs at a time and knocking on doors, begging people to let me in. Finally, we get to the sixth floor, there's no escape, and they're ready to pounce on me. And Geraldo, in a black beret, in a black leather jacket, says, stop, puts his hands out, stop. He's my client. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, <laughs> are you gonna arrest this man? No, we're leaving. And we literally left the Gouverneur Projects without a scratch. In a community that had been neglected and forgotten, the Young Lords brought new hope to Puerto Ricans of all ages. When we came back to the church a second time, there were 20,000 people surrounding this church. Little old ladies who, I remember one old lady who came up and she said, mira nena, ven acá. And she showed me in her arm sleeve, she had an old pistol about this long. It was rusty and broken, but she said, yeah, okay, okay. You know? And we were like, thank you very much. I mean, it didn't work, but she had probably been saving it since the days of the National Party, since Don Pedro, you know? Neither the activism nor the violence of the 1970s solved the problems facing Puerto Ricans. At the time of Luis Muñoz Marin's death in 1980, Puerto Rico was in a kind of limbo, without a unified vision or a charismatic leader to point the way. The rifts between parties were wider than ever. 
Despite these political divisions, the entire country was paralyzed with grief. I think it was an end of an era when my grandfather died. The lines of people coming to the Capitol went around the Capitol building. The flag that was on the casket is full of lipstick. And when it was first given to my grandmother after it was at the Capitol, it just smelled like everything. It smelled like cologne, like perfume, like sweat, like cigarettes, like rum. His people soaked into that, that flag. And people, when, when they came to give my grandmother their condolences, they would say, they would even say, I'm not a popular, but I loved your husband so. Both Luis Munoz Marin and Pedro Albizu Campos went to their graves without having attained economic stability or independence for Puerto Ricanos. By the 1980s, widespread poverty led to an escalation in federal assistance for Puerto Rico. Today, unemployment is at 12%, and 50% of the population receives food stamps and health care benefits from the U.S. budget. In the 1993 plebiscite, Commonwealth status won again, this time by a 3% margin over statehood. The victorious Commonwealth Party asked the United States for a sovereign bilateral compact between two nations. In simple terms, Puerto Rico would gain independence, except in the areas of defense and U.S. security. Puerto Ricans are still waiting for a response. Despite our diverse political views, a single thread unites Puerto Ricans, the conviction that our culture must be preserved. It is crucial to our dignidad. So there's that beautiful sky and that beautiful vista. What's your vista for the future of Puerto Rico? Well, uh, yo quiero que I like Puerto Rico to maintain its own uh, culture. I mean, culture doesn't mean that we are going to be exactly as we are today or we were yesterday. Culture uh, has to evolve and be dynamic, but that uh, our uh, values, the main values will be maintained and that Puerto Rico will be a sovereign country uh, as an independent republic or uh, politically associated uh, with dignity to the United States. My vision for Puerto Rico is that we go back to an idea. We've never been there before, but we go back to an idea that we've had for generations, which is that we are the only Puerto Ricans on the face of the earth. This does not repeat itself, that we have to take care of ourselves because if we disappear from the face of the earth, there will never be another Puerto Rican. And just as we had indigenous people here who were wiped out by some of our ancestors, we are wiping our, ourselves out with the way that we depend too much on the on, on United States to help us. <laughs> I've introduced you to my Isla del Encanto, Mi Puerto Rico. With me, you've met Los Puerto Ricanos in my childhood neighborhood in the South Bronx and across the island. As for me, it's been an incredible journey back home to the land where my parents and grandparents came from, to the place I fell in love with even before I stepped on its soil. I hope you feel you know us a little better. Perhaps you'll ponder some questions about us. Have we maintained our dignity and our culture? What have we gained or lost in that effort? And what will the United States do about Puerto Rico next? On May 1st, 2003, after over 50 years of U.S. military presence in Puerto Rico, the United States Navy departed the island of Vieques. The 15,000 plus acres of land still remains under the control of the U.S. Department of Interior, 
and demands for decontamination, cleanup, and return of the land to the citizens of Vieques remain unmet. Viequenses and Puerto Ricans worldwide continue their peaceful efforts to regain complete control of their land. años de historia forjando la patria nuestra abriendo el surco y sembrando semilla de independencia nuestro pueblo está de pie y luchando con conciencia nuestro pueblo está de pie y luchando con conciencia yo quiero que mi borinque sea libre y soberana yo quiero que mi borinque sea libre y soberana porque la estrella de mi bandera no cabe en la americana la estrella de mi Está llegando el momento de la decisión suprema. Nuestra patria de obedecer, de luz el alma se llena. Nuestro pueblo canta y baila al ritmo de bomba y plena. Nuestro pueblo canta y baila al ritmo de bomba y plena. Yo quiero que mi borinque sea libre y soberano. ¡Vamos! Yo quiero que mi borinque sea libre y soberano. Porque la estrella de mi bandera no está. Funding for this program was provided by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. Additional funding was provided by the MacArthur Foundation, the Ford Foundation, and the National Latino Communications Center.